What's up, everybody? It's Dr. Austin Perlmutter. The other day, I posted about how our food does so much more than just act as simple fuel for our bodies. And I mentioned that food helps shape our identity. Uh, kind of an interesting concept. A lot of people reached out to me with questions about that and said they wanted a bit more. And so I wanted to make this video to address some of those questions and to get into a bit of the fascinating research that again connects what we eat with who we are. So let's start with what is identity? It's kind of a nebulous concept, but the definitions are something along the lines of the character or personality of an individual. It's our individuality, who or what a person or thing is. It's how you define who you are. <laughs> There's a lot to all that, but is this really substantial? Is identity real? Is it something we create? Is it even a helpful term? You know, these are philosophical, psychological questions. What I want to focus on is more specifically how our food, how our microbes shape the idea of what we call identity. So there was this psychologist named Eric Erickson, and I guess we should forgive his parents. It's not a very original first name. Uh, he was one of the first people to question the concept of, the idea of identity. He looked at several different types of identities, including ego identity, the self, the personal identity, uh, what separates us from others, as well as the social or cultural identity. A solid sense of identity has been deemed an important component in healthy psychology, but in some ways, I think this is a little bit misleading because if we base our identity too rigidly, we're going to have a really rough time learning and enjoying life. Uh, so we don't wanna base identity on false premises or we're not going to be all that successful. So it seems to some extent we need a sense of identity but it has to be built on some flexibility. We hear a lot about this term, the concept of identity in pop culture. Um, and really a lot of the messaging that marketers are, are targeting us with has to do with or plays to our identity. We buy clothes, we buy cars, we vote in a certain way, uh, not just because we have some unbiased perspective on how to maximize uh, or to uh, improve our utility function as far as happiness, but because these actions largely reflect what we consider to be our identity. And we know that our faith, our family, where we grew up, all of these things influence our identity, this, this concept that's quite closely related to what we call the self. Um, but regardless on where you stand, as far as whether the self or identity is something that is indivisible and represents some sort of a, a deep concrete uh, concept within us, I think we can agree that identity itself is open to modification by our environment. That's literally the main goal of marketing. It gets us to associate certain brands with a reflection of who we are or what we want ourselves to be, what we believe we could become. And again, this probably isn't all that much news to you. You've heard about some of this as it relates to marketing. So let's now go into the promised uh, topic of this video, which is the association between identity and our food. Um, I think this requires a little bit of a buildup in what we're considering as far as stages of evidence. So I think we can agree that food is the literal building material for our bodies. Uh, we're not fixating much nitrogen. And while we do accumulate some molecules from our environmental sources besides food, our basic composition comes from the molecules that come from what we consume. So our, our physical uh, makeup is a reflection of our diet. Okay. And then I had mentioned that our genetic expression is also modified by our environment, and that includes our food choices. Uh, this is the basic premise of the concept of epigenetics, and this is, in essence, the idea that our environment modifies not necessarily our genes themselves, but our genetic expression, which may actually be more important in several ways. Um, this is definitely a little bit more complicated than the, the basic point about uh, physical makeup, but it is important. And I do have an article coming out um, that will be talking about epigenetics and dietary modification for epigenetics in more detail. But if it's something that's interesting to you, I wrote an article in 2014 
on uh, drperlmutter.com called Dietary Epigenetics New Frontiers. So you can go check that out if you want to learn more. So now let's move on to the impact of our food in our memory, our cognition, our mood. Um, these things, memory, cognition, mood, are largely determined by our brain function. We know that the integrity, the stability of our brains um, as it relates to the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, that these are things that correlate quite directly with our memory um, and with our cognition. We also know that there are changes in brain activation patterns, neurotransmitters, and in the physical structure of our brain that correlate with mood issues, things like depression and anxiety. And going back to the first point about our food creating the building blocks of our bodies, um, we know that food is eventually transmitted in the form of neurotransmitters between our neurons and those signals change the way that our neurons function. So, uh, and this is not just about the macronutrients we eat, it's the micronutrients and the phytonutrients, uh, which are plant-based nutrients uh, that are not micro or macronutrients um, that modify our brain function. And we also know that things like uh, our, our food choices can influence our hormones, our immune function, and that these are things that also have a major role in how our brains function. Okay, so now let's bring all of this together. How does food influence our sense of identity? Again, identity is a tough thing to pin down. And I think we wanna believe it's a little bit more of a substantial term than what it really turns out to be. But if we go back to our definitions and we say identity is what a person is, then physically, of course, our food changes our identity. It changes our physical infrastructure. But what if we instead go with the idea that identity is a reflection of the character or the personality of an individual? Uh, so then we talk about things like our personality traits. Um, so let's break that down. Let's talk about the interface between personality traits as a reflection of identity and our food choices. There are many ways you can talk about personality traits, uh, but I want to stick with the big five. You may have heard of these before. This is one of the most common models for personality traits, and these traits are open-mindedness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. It's thought that personality traits are relatively stable over the lifespan, but they do change. Um, so there, there's research showing that uh, people do show increased self-confidence, warmth, self-control, emotional stability as they age. So evidence that our personality does change as a reflection of our years on earth. Um, but let's get more into how our, our diet may be able to modify our personality traits. What about things like uh, phytonutrients? Like I said, these are these plant-based molecules that are not macronutrients, vitamins, or minerals uh, that can have an effect on our health. And I think the most potent example of something like this would be uh, the molecule called psilocybin, which you've probably heard about as it relates to magic mushrooms, but also as it relates to a lot of research in depression these days. Uh, so psilocybin is converted into psilocin in the body, which is the active ingredient. Um, and there's been a lot of talk as to what does it do within the body and how does it modify our psychology? And so there was an interesting study published in 2018, which was entitled Effects of Psilocybin Therapy on Personality Structure. And they took 20 patients with resistant depression. That's one of the uh, groups of people they've been looking at as far as the effects of psilocybin. And they gave these people psilocybin and then assessed their personality at baseline and then at three months. And what they found is a significant decrease in scores of neuroticism and an increase in scores of openness and extroversion. So again, what we're saying here is a molecule found in a food, in this case, the food is the psilocybin containing mushroom um, that has a seemingly direct impact on our personality traits. So very interesting research here, but obviously that's a very potent intervention and certainly not something that we would expect to see uh, with the day-to-day -day dietary influences as far as that type of time span. So now let's look at a paper entitled uh, Five Factor Model Personality Traits and Inflammatory Markers, New Data and a Meta-Analysis. And this comes from the Journal of Psychoneuroimmunology from 2014. Here they looked at those five traits that I described before, and they compared these traits or people's 
uh, scaled responses as to their levels of these traits with their level of inflammation. So they were looking at markers like C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, as well as interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory marker uh, that tends to be also notably elevated in things like depression, and most recently has been found to be predictive of worse outcomes in COVID. So they found that higher levels of CRP, C-reactive protein, and interleukin-6 correlated with lower levels of conscientiousness. We don't necessarily know the directionality of this. It may be either way, but it's at least worthwhile to think about the fact that our immune system activation may reflect and may also influence our personality. Um, as it relates to diet, you know, there's so much good evidence that our inflammatory status is modified by what we eat uh, through our gut health, through our microbiome, um, and also through the composition of things like refined and simple carbohydrates that can, through a variety of mechanisms, including through visceral fat, uh, increase our inflammatory markers, things like CRP and interleukin-6. It's also interesting to note in the context of the research we discussed in the book Brainwash, which shows that even a short-term elevation in inflammation may be sufficient to cause people to uh, behave more impulsively, to think more impulsively. And so if you think about what that means as far as personality, the way that we think, the way that we make decisions, that's actually something that is incorporated into the big five personality traits. So what we're saying here is that on a moment to moment basis, or in the case of these studies, minute to minute basis, our inflammatory or our immune status, which may be a function of our foods, could be changing what we call our personality. Okay, so I couldn't do this video, of course, without talking about the gut and the microbiome. Uh, we know that the microbes in our large intestine or the colon are majorly influenced by our choices in food. And we're rapidly learning that these microbes are also influencing our mental and our cognitive health, basically our brain function. Uh, there was an especially interesting study published on this in March of 2020 called Gut Microbiome Composition and Diversity are related to human personality traits, and it was published in the Human Microbe Journal. What they found uh, was a couple of things actually, but they found that um, being more social is associated with a higher diversity in microbes. And maybe not super surprising there because if you're around more people, you'll have more exposure to a variety of things. And so uh, one of the things that might result from that is more diversity of microbes. Um, they also found that anxiety and stress are associated with a reduced diversity of the microbiome. As it relates to these big five personality traits, it was interesting to note they found that agreeableness was related with a decreased diversity in the microbiome. So again, a connection there that the microbial diversity is correlated with a personality trait or at least a level a score of a specific personality trait. And then the last point I want to talk about here is as it relates to hormones. Um, we all know that our food choices significantly influence our levels of various hormones, our circulating hormones. Things like insulin, ghrelin, and leptin have been pretty explicitly labeled in the last uh, several decades as reflective of what we're putting into our bodies. Uh, in the field of endocrinology, the study of hormones, there have been multiple studies that attempt to correlate big five personality traits with cortisol, cortisol being the prototypical stress hormone. And several of these studies have found an association between higher levels of cortisol and higher levels of trait neuroticism. There's also though data that suggests that people with decreased trait conscientiousness may have higher risk for leptin resistance. And you may have heard of leptin resistance as one of these more interesting newer concepts within the realm of metabolic dysfunction. This may be more uh, directional towards the uh, decreased conscientiousness actually causing the leptin levels to go up in the way of a uh, person making worse dietary decisions as decreased conscientiousness can be seen in some ways as a, a decrease, uh, or I should say an increase in impulsive thinking. But at least it's interesting to make that correlation here between our, our personality trait and the levels of this metabolically active hormone, which is leptin. Okay, 
So this was really an attempt to synthesize uh, what I think are some of the most interesting studies and concepts around this connection between identity, uh, that kind of vague term, and what we eat. And I think what we should take away from this is that our food choices really are quite significant. It's so much more than just the question of the fuel that we're putting into our bodies. Who and what we are from the level of our genetic expression all the way up to the way our personalities uh, are expressed seems to involve or seems to be influenced by what we put into our bodies, our inputs. And among the most important of those inputs is our food choices. So what I want you to see is that as it relates to identity, things may not be quite as stable as we thought they were. And I think that may be a good thing because it means that when we go and eat food, we can be changing ourselves, not just at a cellular level, but at the level of our psychology, at the level of the way we interact with other people. So by choosing better options in food, and certainly this isn't the time to do an entire lecture on what those options are, but by choosing generally less processed options in our food, we may be helping to program our bodies and our brains in a variety of ways. One of those ways being for a more advantageous personality, a more advantageous identity. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to share it with a friend and let me know what you think. Till next time, I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter.